let's continue exploring the universe within art and the art behind Redstone. I'm your host, Amla Du. And recently, there have been several comments inquiring about the XOR gate and the low-level D-latch, more specifically on how exactly they work. Several other people have voiced their confusion in regards to comparators, and all of these questions are interconnected through the comparator. Understanding the XOR gate or the low-level D-latch also means understanding the comparator, because the complex parts about these gates are the complex parts about comparators. So in this episode, we're going to take a second look at the comparator, the XOR gate, and the low-level D-latch. The main thing that makes comparators seem complicated is that they are one of the only components that interact with signal strength. They take the signal strength of the input and provide that same signal strength as the output. If there are three active dust after the comparator, that means the dust before the comparator has a signal strength of three. So essentially, the comparator by itself is just extending the signal by two, whereas using a repeater, completely refreshes the signal back up to 15. Signal strength is just the distance that redstone can travel, so a strength of 15 can activate 15 dust going off in any direction. So the closer that the power source is, the farther the dust can be active. The signal strength goes down by 1 every time it passes through redstone dust, except that the comparator takes the strength of the dust before it and provides that same strength for the dust after it. So the dust next to this lever has a strength of 15, then 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. So this comparator is carrying the strength of 10 from the dust behind it to the dust after it. So that first dust still has 10, but then we have 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. And then a strength of 0 means the dust is turned off, so it's not powering anything. So really, the comparator is just carrying the signal strength from the input to the output without letting that strength degrade. But it also has the subtraction mode option, which by itself does nothing. But when on subtraction mode, it will subtract the strength of the side input from the main input. The dust next to the lever has a strength of 15, so the next dust has a strength of 14, so we have 14 being subtracted from the input. And since the input has a strength of 15, we are left with an output of 1. And that is exactly how this XOR gate works. If you missed the last episode, an XOR gate will activate the output when either the left or the right input are activated, but not when both inputs are activated. The dust next to the lever has a strength of 15, and as dust travels, it goes down. So this dust has a strength of 14 going into the side of that comparator. Same way, the dust going into the front of the comparator also has a strength of 14. So we have 14 minus 14 equals 0, so that comparator is turned off. But the other comparator is turned on, and that is because we have a strength of 15, 14, then 13 going into the front of the comparator, then 12, 11 going into the side. So you have 13 minus 11 equals 2. So the left comparator is putting an output of 2. And because strength is based on distance, since each lever is the same distance from the front and the side of their corresponding comparators, and because stronger strength will overwrite weaker strength, if both levers are turned on, then both comparators have an input of 14 and have 14 being subtracted from them. So you end up with an output of 0. And this only works on subtraction mode because on the default mode, the side strength has to be stronger than the input strength for it to turn off. So as long as they're on subtraction mode and the inputs are the same distance from their corresponding comparators, this will work regardless of where those inputs are. Because the distance from the lever to the closest comparator into the front and the side is the same distance because it's connecting on this corner right here. So this lever is five dust away from the front and the side of this comparator. But this other comparator, the side is farther away. It's always going to be two dust farther for the left lever to make it to the side of the right comparator because it has to curve around the comparator to make it to the side. So the levers will prevent the comparator that is closest to them from ever being able to turn on. That's probably why you usually see XOR gates built in this fashion, because this doesn't use any comparators at all. It's very easy to see how this works. So both of these side torches that are turned on are the inputs, and they are both powering this center dust. If both of these torches ever turn off, this middle torch will turn on, which will then power this lower dust which will prevent the output torches from ever turning on. Whereas if only a single of the input torches are turned off, 
that will then turn on the corresponding output torch, these down here. Now as for actual uses for the XOR gate, I have seen people make calculators using the XOR gates, but really, for most people, the most practical application for this is having a lever on both sides of a door, where each of those levers can toggle the door between open and closed. Basically, the XOR just allows you to use multiple levers. Which then brings us to the low-level D-latch. So a D-latch stores data by having a data input and a clock input. Now this specific design will store the signal strength data. So when we clock the data by turning on that lever, it will then lock into place the signal strength of the data input. So in this case, we locked in the signal strength of 1 until we turn off the clock. The way this works is we have a comparator checking the signal strength of the data. So if the data input is a signal strength of 1, that comparator will be taking the signal strength of 1 and transferring it to this dust. Then this comparator will be taking the strength of 1 from that dust, shoving it through that block to the output. Then this third comparator is creating an infinite loop with the second comparator because it's providing and receiving the same signal strength, so the strength never degrades. But as long as this torch is turned on, that will be locking that comparator so that it cannot create an infinite loop. But as soon as we turn on the lever, that will turn off the torch, which will then allow this comparator to infinitely loop that signal strength. This is also called an input stabilizer or an RS latch. So the second comparator is taking the signal of 1, shoving it through that block, so the third comparator also is receiving a signal of 1 and is shoving it through that block, which is giving the second comparator a strength of 1, and so this goes on infinitely, so the signal never degrades. And at the same time, when the clocking lever is turned on, it will turn on that repeater, which will lock this first comparator, preventing it from ever updating the infinite loop's signal strength. Since stronger strength will overwrite weaker strength, without that repeater, that comparator could update the infinite loop with the new information. And the subtraction mode comparators, in this case, are not actually subtracting anything. If the comparators weren't on subtraction mode, if they had a maximum strength of 15, they would not be turned off by the repeaters. Because keep in mind that when not on subtraction mode, the side input has to be greater than the main input for the comparator to actually turn off. Whereas subtraction mode is subtracting the side input from the main input. So it needs to be equal to or greater than to turn it off. Another way to visualize how this works, instead of using a gold pressure plate, we can use distance. So here we have multiple inputs that are all a different distance from the data input. I'm also subtracting a strength of 8 by using this chest that has enough items in it to have a strength of 8. And we're subtracting that from the main input line just so that they don't have to be super far away. So from the farthest input, we have 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10 going into this comparator, but 8 is being subtracted from that, so we have an output of 2. So the dust right before the next comparator has a signal strength of 1. So it's carrying that signal strength of 1 all the way to the output. So if we clock that data, locking it into place by turning on this lever, now even if we activate some of the other inputs, the output will not change. So with this, we will know which lever was activated when the machine was clocked, until the clock gets unlocked, and then it will update the information. In a previous episode, we looked at how to have multiple inputs running on the same redstone line using strength. And so you could use a low-level D-latch in the middle of this machine. That way it could remember which color of button was activated when the D-latch was clocked. You know, clocked means checked. So like if you attach the clocking device to either something else or directly to the buttons, you know, you could press the yellow button and then it would clock that data into place until you unclocked it. I hope that makes sense. But either way, the, the low-level D-latch doesn't have very many practical applications. Just know that you can combine it with something like this that encodes and decodes different signals based on strength. And I will link that video here on the screen and in the video description in case you are curious. But just know that the low-level D-latch especially does not have very many practical uses. Like maybe in logistical redstone where you're building computers that play Tetris and things like that. But as for your everyday custom redstone, I have never found a practical use for the low-level D-latch. And same way with the XOR gate. I have never actually used it in a creation. Now I will say that the XOR gate is pretty fancy just by being able to separate levers from each other. So that you can have a lever on both sides of a door 
and both levers will work to toggle that door between open and closed. But either way, it's always good to learn, so I hope you have a better understanding of how the comparator works after watching this video. And I really hope you enjoyed this. If you did, don't forget to like, favorite, share, and subscribe, and be sure to leave a comment even if it's just to say hi. But I've been your host, Amala Du, sharing a redstone trick or two, and reminding you as always, don't forget to have fun. Bye-bye!